Welcome, this is a session design tips for constructible steel frame buildings in high seismic regions. Uh, to do, today's two presenters are John Hooper and Scott Aiden. Um, two very knowledgeable individuals on this topic and uh, very pleased to have them here today. Our first speaker is John Hooper. He is Senior Principal and Director of Earthquake Engineering at Magnuson Clemensic and Associates in Seattle, Washington. Um, as far as his activities associated with AISC, he's a member of the Committee on Specifications and also sits on TC9, which is the task committee for the seismic provisions. Please welcome John Hooper. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here this morning. I'm pleased everyone made it up so early the next day after the official party last night. Hopefully you all had a good time. I'd like to also mention my co-conspirators on this presentation. You see them on the screen. Besides Scott, it's Bob Hazelton. Larry Muir and Raphael Sabelli. The only other person besides Scott and I that are in the room is, is Raphael. He's in the back. He'll correct me when I stumble over his slides. So there's a collaboration of a lot of input from all the team members here this morning. So if I can't answer the question, I'll refer to them as well. Uh, as you need to know, here is the PDH. The PDH that you care about this morning is the one on top. It's 37675. Once again, the PDH for this morning's session is 37675, since you were in session N15A, or N15 Alpha. Now that I've got that underway, you all have that written down? Okay, let's go ahead and start. Um, this is for high seismic regions. This is the, the, when what we do in high seismic is different than what we do in low seismic. Uh, low seismic is very simple. You say R equals three and you have a nice day. It's very simple, you use AISA 360, and you don't worry about the stuff we're gonna talk about today. It gets, the, it ramps up a little bit when you go to the high seismic. And this map here shows what we mean by high seismic. Anything that is yellow and, and darker, if you will, from yellow to dark yellow to red in the West Coast, uh, the, the Wasatch area, New Madrid and Charleston, that's what we mean by high seismic. High seismic is, is, is defined as seismic design category D, as in David, and that's what gets you an AISC 341. So that's the region we're talking about. How many are from the region that designs in these locales? Who's from that, these spots? What are the rest of you guys doing here? Just kidding. In case you want to do designs here, that's all, it's all good. So uh, we'll do the best we can to give you some tips about what is important. Uh, I'm just gonna go through what the systems available to us are because in low seismic, anything goes. You can do just about any configuration, any shape, and you can call it whatever you want, it doesn't matter because essentially they're undefined. But in seismic, you have to define what they are. And, and there, once again, there's only a couple of handfuls. Uh, first one is special and ordinary concentrically braced frames. Um, we'll talk about limitations in just a second. We also have buckling restrained brace frames. They look a lot alike in a very schematic or conceptual level like shown on this slide because in, in reality they perform in a similar fashion, one a little bit better than the other in my humble opinion. And then there's also eccentrically brace frames where you change what the link is and you deal with the, uh, the fusing we'll talk about later in a very special location. Due to the fact that eccentrically braced frames aren't used that much these days, they've kind of been overtaken by the two on the left, the, the, the concentrically braced frame and the BRBs, buckling and strain braces. We're not gonna talk very much about EBFs. We're gonna talk more about these two over here because once again, if you're doing a brace frame, they're used probably 95% of the time in high seismic. Where are these used and what, what kind of assist situations? These are pictures from our, my practice at Magnuson Clemensic. Uh, here's a baseball stadium up in Seattle where the Mariners play woeful uh, baseball. They're really bad at it. It's a, a classic. At that time, you were allowed to do an ordinary concentrically braced frame when this was designed, amazing as it is. A, an, an example of what can be built uh, using that system. Here's a brand new stadium. It's for my hated rivals, the San Francisco 49ers. But we had, to, we had the luxury of designing it for them. I hope it works. Um, but that is a buckling restrained brace frame. So in the course of about 15 years, where stadiums and arenas were doing concentrically brace frames, a lot of them have merged and gone over to the buckling restrained braces because of their superior behavior and their economics. It's usually a, a better choice economically to do a buckling or strain brace frame. And here shows some uh, real live pictures. And you'll notice some things that probably aren't that wonderful, and that's a very low angle slope. We don't always control our destiny. Sometimes the architect tells us what to do, unfortunately. But anyways, we'll talk about geometry later on in this talk. And then uh, 
Bridge frames can be used for other reasons or other types. And here's a high rise in San Francisco. High rises are typically, you don't think about it buckling and restraining braces, but for outriggers to help this thing be stabilized and give it a better depth for overturning, we have outriggers that are buckling and restraining braces in this high rise in San Francisco, a very smart use of a BRB to help take the loads for earthquake and high events. And here it is being built. Uh, a very in interesting constructability point right here is when you're doing, I hate to say, we're mirroring a concrete building, which this is, with a steel buckling restraint brace. How do you do that? Well, you put structural steel inside the concrete to make the connections work. So what you have here is a bunch of connections that you have steel coming up that allow this thing to be built and, and uh, fabricated fairly well and, and put together fairly quickly. Then moment frames. There's basically two types. Oh, well, you yeah, have the uh, spe special, intermediate, ordinary moment frames, the classic ones. Uh, by and large, in high seismic, we're stuck with using the special uh, for a couple of good reasons. One, they perform much better. Uh, and, and, uh, and two, you get a higher R factor, so there's economy right there. There's another special moment frame that isn't used very much. So these on the, that I show here are probably used 95% of the time. No, I take that back, 99% of the time. We've had the, ch the luxury of designing something called a special truss moment frame. Anytime you have a very long span, well, let's say 40 or 50 feet, uh, a regular or a special moment frame just isn't going to cut it. It's too soft. It drifts too much. And trying to do a, a, a deeper truss system like this is a better way to go. Again, they're used so infrequently. I'm not spending much time on this, again, because it's a very special system. But again, if you ever have a very long span, moment frame and, the, and you want to have that kind of feel of openness and flexibility of, of, of architectural space, that is not a bad option uh, to use. And I'll show you a couple examples of, of what I showed an example where that's used. Here's a hospital. Uh, look at the skeleton. It's just a special moment frame. And if there's one occupancy types that loves moment frames, it's healthcare for a couple of reasons. Um, they change their, once you build a healthcare facility, the day you open it, that's the day they start doing tenant improvements. It never stays the same throughout its lifetime. They're always reconfiguring. And moment frames are a very good way for them to be able to do that without having to worry about where that brace was. I can't move a brace. I can't move a concrete sure wall. Moment frames are the, the approach they like to take. Typically, though, they can't afford them because the cost of doing a moment frame relative to a brace frame is, is substantially different. And I'll talk about that in a little bit. Uh, here's a project in San Jose, San Jose Airport, where we had some long spans, and they wanted that architectural freedom and in the, in the plan flexibility. So if you can see here, they decided to go with long span special trust moment frames. You can see them here, here, and up here. And so it's, it's hidden, but it allows them the flexibility, because these are about 40 or 50 foot spans, and allow them to economically get the look and the feel of the facility that they were looking for. Again, I've only used this on a handful of conditions. We won't talk about it much here, but long spans, a reasonable, good way to go. And then shear walls. Uh, we've, done, we've done some sure, still play shear walls here in, in the West Coast, um, back about, starting about early, 19, uh, early 2000, if, if you will, we did some testing. And what we end up doing, and it's not just us now, it's obviously in the spec, very well defined. Here's a federal courthouse. We did this design prior to it being in the spec based upon some testing we did at Berkeley, and this is the kind of system that tip typically gets used on high-rise office or actually federal courthouse-type buildings. They love the, the robustness of a steel plate sure wall. Um, it gives them a lot of flexibility in, in, in the plan for the courtrooms and things of that nature. Again, it's not used as much, so we won't spend a whole lot of time on that, uh, but it's in the spec now, and it's pretty easy to um, go through the process. What you'll notice here is something we did because of uh, the large overturning demands. Uh, is these large round composite columns you see right here. Uh, it's a great idea for us as structural engineers. It gives us a great overturning element, a vertical boundary element, if you will. The, the, the architects hate them because they can't detail a round column. They like things that are, they don't like that column over here and over here because they can't fit partitions. It doesn't line very well. And boy, did we hear about it. We loved it from an ec economical strategy, getting the right demands. They didn't like it whatsoever. So. Be careful when you use a round column in something like a courthouse. They're very particular in their programming. And here's a table that derives or drives everything and what we're able and not able to do. I apologize for this. I am ASC7. I'm the seismic chair of that as well. 
So if you have a problem with this table, you can blame me and my colleagues that work on this. But what we see here, these are all the steel systems. And what you'll see is in seismic design category D, we're limited sometimes in height, but if you try to go, these are the systems we can use. So you can only go to some heights and some systems as it stands right now. If you look at a steel ordinary concentrically braced frame, you're limited to 35 feet. So you can't go very tall with ordinary. We want you to go to special. So we're forcing higher ductile systems and high seismic. So that's really the, the fundamental approach that we take in high seismic. And you can look at the other systems. And these are only two pages you, you can use in seismic. I just put down this one just for fun to remind us all that it's not permitted. But boy, it's a lot of fun when you go to low seismic. You can do whatever you want. And so uh, just to juxtapose what's there and available and what you can and can't do. And what you'll notice here is dual systems are allowed. There's no limits at all. And um, cantilever column systems, much like ordinary concentrically braced frames, are limited to 35 feet as well. And not a bad choice if you're doing something very uh, small and that can just do it with a cantilever kind of a system. So anyways, that's kind of where we get the system selection. That's the table. The table is much longer than that. I, once again, I condensed it just for us today. That system as you, table, as you know, has 84 line items on it. I showed you the 20 that we can use for steel in high seismic. OK, what are the issues that we face that help drive the system selection? I want to talk big picture first before we talk about detailing of stuff. Um, I talked about a, a little bit. One of the classic things we're dealing with these days is a multi-use facility. What do I mean by that? There's, it's not uncommon to have a building that is a condominium in the top 10 floors. The next 10 floors are office. The lowest two levels are retail. And subgrade is parking. Now think about all those four different uses I just described and how do you marry a system and select one that's going to be good for all of them. So that's a challenge we face. So if you have just a healthcare facility, it's pretty straightforward. If you have just an office building, it's pretty straightforward because the grids and things work out. If you're dealt with, dealing with this multi-purpose or multi-use facility, dealing and getting something, a grid that goes from top to bottom uh, directly is a challenge. So if you have one of those, uh, Work carefully with the architect and get them, get them to work hard to give you what you need because that will drive your system selection. It makes it tough to find stuff that works as efficiently as you would like to as a structural engineer. Large volume spaces, things like big industrial facilities, big theaters, um, big museums, things like that. The challenge they cause is you have large length of columns, unbraced going 30, 40, and 50 feet. Uh, the braces might span 60 or 70 feet because there's no floor diaphragm for two or three levels. So the challenge on constructability in these large volume spaces is how to deal with large column and bracing or other types of elements. One, for how big they get and how large the crane can pick them. Okay, there's limitations on what a crane can pick. It's between 25 and 30,000 pounds. So you've got to be thinking about how big these things are so that you can actually build them without having them to splice them too often. And, and when they start to try to construct them. So that's what large volume spaces to think about. It's that the unbraced length issue causes lots of different challenges to be mindful of. Future flexibility, I mentioned earlier, that's a buzzword, especially in the healthcare, like I mentioned before. It's also in, in the lab and research area. They like to change things around a, a lot, like I mentioned. So that drives system selection. And again, they like to go with moment frames if they can. Again, the challenge is the cost. Um, I did a hospital where we tried really hard to get this flexibility built in. They said, we want a moment frame. We told them it would cost you 30 bucks a square foot. They said, how about a brace frame? And it cost about 18 bucks a square foot. They chose to live with the buckling restrained braces. They weren't just special braces because at the end of the day, money matters. And so they left with the, the fact that the braces will be there forever. They will program around them in the future. But that was the dialogue that you get when flexibility is on the top of the owners or the architect's list of things that are important to them in, in their facility moving forward. Floor to floor heights affect how we do things. Um, again, floor to floor heights, uh, if you're doing residential, the floor to floor height is 10 foot two. And that's why steel doesn't work, unfortunately, very well in 10 foot two, foot foot, unless you do the girder slap system, which is a very unique and very viable system for uh, residential. So you don't see a lot of steel buildings for residential. Uh, but anything beyond that, floor, floor, floor heights, anything 12 feet and above is something that is very effective for steel. And you'll see things as high as 20 to 22 feet when you're doing a courthouse. And so you have to think about how long those columns are and how flexible that system is going to be when you do your design. 
and again, how large the members will be to, for the, the guy picking the, those members off with the crane. Grid spacing is something you want to establish early. You want to keep, keep it as repetitious as you can. If you get in early enough, you can direct the team and say, well, I want these columns every 30 feet. We just work with the programming module, et cetera. Very important. Uh, but it, once you get a regular system, it helps not only the seismic, it helps the gravity. You get a very efficient floor framing system, and your costs go from 18 bucks a square foot down to $16 a square foot if you're very good about getting that done early in the design process. And then member size, I mentioned earlier, uh, this is the key, I, I learned this lesson more than once. Uh, again, if you're doing a moment frames or round columns like that, let the architect know earlier or as soon as you have figured out it's going to be a big column because they're not thinking a W36 or W40 column in a moment frame. What are they thinking? A W14, because that's what they're used to seeing. And they're laying out their program areas based upon that dimension. And all of a sudden, you come up with something that's a box that's four feet by three feet, not a box that's two foot by two foot. And that really affects your programming layout. So early and often about what sizes you're thinking about really affects their programming uh, decisions so that you don't get it at the end. OK, now I'm going to jump after about what the programming issues might be in system selection. Again, we're at the higher level about what's happening. What about system configuration, what to avoid? These are obvious. Uh, but to everyone, but again, these happen, especially in these multi-use facilities, like I mentioned, where you're transferring potentially from a different one program to another, and it requires our systems to be transferred as well, potentially. But we try, like heck, to avoid the fact we have a brace frame coming down, all of a sudden it stops, and it gets transferred over to the outside of the building. Why? Well, there's, it's an irregularity. It's a big diaphragm transfer issue. It, it's a lot of money to cause that to happen structurally to make that gymnastics work, and you also affect behavior of the building accordingly. Remember, this is high seismic, and behavior in seismic is important to get the right kind of uh, result if the, the earthquake occurs. And here's another thing that happens. Again, multi-use, the transfer system that we see all the time. Again, you pay for these each and every time. Anywhere between twenty dollars and $40,000 for a transfer beam, a transfer truss, or a sloping column. Those are the toolkit items that we get to use. It really affects things, uh, especially if it's part of your lateral force resisting system. You try not to let that be the case. But you have to be careful, especially about a, a sloping column and a transfer truss concept. Even though, if let's say that's a gravity transfer, and you say, well, it's not in my seismic model, that brace might act and probably will act as a seismic force resisting system element you need to include in the model or f make that be a free floating edge to it. A, a you know, pin slider, if you will, so you don't have unintended consequences, unintended stiffness here at, the, at a transfer trust situation, something to be very cognizant of. And even a sloping column does the same sort of thing. It acts like a brace, and you better look at it and make sure it doesn't do anything unintended in your design. And last, on a consistent configuration, is a lot of times where, the, where you know that you can put a structural system is around the elevator cores. This is a great spot to put it, but the problem or challenge you face right there is there's openings all the way around it, right? There's elevators here, there's stairs, there's mechanical rooms. Where's your diaphragm? How do you connect to the diaphragm? So you have to be very careful about how you make that transfer from the diaphragm back into your bracing elements. Let's say this is a brace frame core. You gotta get the loads in somehow, so you have to be very careful on how you cause that to happen, drag struts, the collectors, et cetera, to make that happen. So you gotta be careful in those sort of um, layouts. Okay, now we're going to talk about configuration specifically about different types of systems. Again, I'm narrowing the issues down to the ones that are used most commonly. If we have a choice on a moment frame, the perimeter is a great place to put it. Um, it it's actually where the architects would prefer it because it doesn't in, encumber what they're trying to do anywhere else in the building. Uh, so it basically gives them a complete free open space in here. Because uh, we don't have any pre-qualified connections on the weak axis of columns, unless you do a box or a, a cruciform-like column, this is typically uh, not part of the system in this location right here. So you have to be careful to make sure you get enough bays in both directions for that moment frame to be effective. If you're doing a brace frame, um, the preference structurally is to put on the outside of the building. It's a much better torsional resistance. Um, it's very uncommon that you get that luxury to put it on the outside of your building. Um, it's amazing how many, unless you're doing a very special design, very high-end designer from somewhere else like Europe, they don't like braces on the outside of the buildings too often. Uh, and so what you end up with is braces in the core. 
And if you do this, you have a challenge with the one thing, torsion, right? You have, you have a big torsional challenge area, be very careful. So just when you have that configuration challenge, look at torsion immediately to make sure you don't have a problem and having that drive your, your results. And then configuration for shear walls, uh, typically given their stiffness and the fact that they act more like a closed cell than a brace frame, almost like a tube, uh, you can probably get that to work in the core if it's big enough. And we've done that on several uh, steel plate shear wall designs. It has enough torsional ro rotational stiffness that you can get away with that and make it work, but still have to check it to make sure that it's going to behave the way you want it to. Okay, those are kind of configurations, architectural programming. Let's talk about, uh, go next to the details of what we're trying to do. This is my Earthquake 101. I, new grads come to the office, they ask me, what do you do, John, for seismic design? I can do it in one slide. It's really simple. I, 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 it's, it's something I learned a long time ago. You have to select the appropriate seismic system. And that's a part of all the things I just talked about. Configuration, programming, owner's desires, cost, constructability, all those get into it. Once you've done that, you want to define the fuse and you never oversize it. If you do a BRB, you need 4.2 inches of steel in a BRB, design it for 4.2. Uh, if you need a bone frame beam that's a W36 by 108, put a 36 by 108 in there and nothing bigger because everything else from that thing is capacity protected around it. So the columns, the foundation, everything else is protected. And so your fuse should be right on and then everything else will be, can be economically designed even using a capacity protected approach. So that's as simple as that. And when you do that capacity protection, you got to consider the pattern of yielding, uh, especially, let's say, in a brace frame, which guys are in tension, which guys are in compression. Go to the seismic design manual. Raphael Sibeli has done a fabulous job providing, providing examples of, of how to get the right configuration. So you know what the maximum demands are in a system and make sure you got the right forces to capacity protect them. Um, and this is something we've done quite a bit. Uh, when we do tall buildings, and what I mean by that, it's, I'm not talking 40 or 50 stories, I'm talking 12 to 16 stories, where you capacity protect, let's say, a buckling restrain brace frame column system. We have found that if you do a nonlinear response history analysis, you can reduce the column overturning demands by about 30%. We're looking at maximum considered earthquake ground motions, so we're talking the big guys, but if you do look at the results, the capacity protection that we provide in AIC is really good. We do the same sort of thing in, in ACI for concrete, if I can use those, that, that acronym. But if you look at the real demands, at, at the real ground motion that we consider important, which is this big guy, the nonlinear response will suggest that you can reduce your column demands. So something to consider. Uh, the software tools, in our opinion, have gone, they're robust enough, they're not perfect by any stretch. They can do it fairly effectively. And we do this uh, commonly in our practice now. Eight years ago, guys, we didn't at all, hardly. But now we do it commonly. Uh, and it's not that far of a reach to do that. So consider that on anything tall, 12 to 16 or higher. Overall structural system issues. Uh, now we're talking about what happens in ASCE 7. What do you do when you go to Chapter 12 and things like that. Uh, things to look about the design base shear. Uh, the higher the R factor, the lower the base shear. The lower the base shear, the lower your demands, the smaller your fuse. So all things being equal, Choose an R equal 8 kind of a system if you can afford, you can make that to happen and you'll get that result. Look at the building period. There's a building period requirement, uh, a, a mandatory minimum. But what you'll find is that you're, in most systems, your period is larger than the empirical value. Make sure you use the increased period that's more realistic with your building. Okay, don't just, don't be stuck with T sub A is what that empirical value is. It's meant to be a lower bound value. It's meant to be conservative. And so be careful using because it is conservative. Uh, use the amplified value as much as you can. So do a dynamic analysis to get the right period. Building drift is huge. Um, it's, it drives systems and steel as, uh, as much as anything. Um, importantly, uh, risk category two buildings is a 2% drift. It's reasonably easy to hit, except for moment frames. As we know, moment frames are always drift controlled. So make sure you, you, you cause that, uh, make sure you understand that and deal with that. But in a healthcare facility, that's why I said that the, the result for my healthcare project was 30 bucks a square foot. We, do, we did a 160 foot tall building, trying to re reach a 1% drift with a steel moment frame. Really, really hard to do. 
uh, economically. Maybe it's a non-starter economically. So building drift is important. Uh, it's not just a moment frame issue. If you aren't careful with your BRBs, you can get close to the drift limits as well. And so because you, you size the area of the BRB to exactly what you need, there's not much left. The, the stiffness strength ratio is really tuned very well, in my humble opinion. Uh, and SCBFs, it's not. You, you, your drift is never an issue because you're adding more steel than you need because the compression buckling controls the sizing of a SCBF. So be careful with BRBs in the drift. Oops. And foundations, uh, we can't forget about foundations. They're about a quarter or 20% of our cost. Um, again, a higher R factor will help you in that regard. Um, spreading out the system, like, in a, uh, like an exterior moment frame, will help your overturning, right? You're so not putting a lot of load at, in one spot. So where this becomes an issue is in brace frames, where you have very discrete brace frames. Your foundation elements get really big underneath those columns, right? You're driving a large, large tension or compression in one little spot. Spreading that out is, is a big deal, especially depending on whether you have shallow or deep foundations. Um, especially deep foundation. If you're going 250 feet down with a caisson, like we do on several projects in San Francisco, that's a big cost. Each caisson costs a million dollars. Don't put a caisson in, you save a million dollars. So it's a big deal. So look at the overturning early, spread that overturning out as much as you can, especially for deep foundation, it becomes a challenging uh, proposition if you don't. And in shallow footings, if you aren't careful, you'll have uplift issues. And so you have to start adding grade beams to tie shallow foundations together. So be careful about that overturning early on in the design, in our opinion, because it can drive your costs crazy, um, and which is not a good thing. OK, so now I'm just going to go into some, some kind of conceptual design issues. I'm not going to go a lot of detail, especially on, on moment frames. Scott's going to go into great detail on moment frames in his portion of the talk. But just some, just some overall overarching things. Uh, and he'll talk a lot about using deep columns, because that's the way you make the drift work. It also helps with a strong column weak beam. Uh, what we try to suggest is no more than a 30-foot span uh, of a, from column of the grid spacing. And if you're doing Category 4, you better be less 25 feet or less to make that drift work. Uh, otherwise, you'll be challenged. There's protect, protected zone. I drew this a little bit too big. It's not that big. But there are protected zones. And, and Scott, I hope we'll get into that a little bit. I don't recall if you do. Um, use your floor beams for the, for the bracing of the moment frame beams. Frame it up. Get it for free. Why not? Make that use your floor framing effectively in that regard for constructability. And there's some special rules about the beam column stability bracing. If you do it right, it's not a big deal. Uh, if, if you have a composite slab, which is pretty typical, uh, this is not a big deal to deal with it either. Moment frames. Uh, again, I'll talk only briefly, Scott. Uh, go to 358. That's where you should, unless you're doing a proprietary system, which there, there are several out there that are very good. Um, you're not going to do proprietary, you can do that. I, it's very rare these days we're doing project-specific testing anymore. At least I don't see it very often, very common. That's why 358 was created, to help us get around that process. And obviously pick the members based upon what the allowed member sizes are in, in 358. And don't forget to include the stiffness reduction values for RBS or enhancements if you're using like a side plate. Side plates are very good for, for controlling drift. You need to model that and deal with that appropriately and, and take advantage of it. Um, this is something I learned a long time ago as, as part of the SAC joint venture. Uh, I had a fabricator from Herrick saying, a web doubler is worth 50 pounds per foot of a column weight. So if you don't throw a web doubler in, increase your column by 50 pounds a foot, and it's still cheaper. And so if you can, and the reason we're doing this, it will help with drift. And the oversizing your columns a little bit helps with strong column weak beam, which you have to maintain, obviously, in a special moment frame. And in our practice and what we've seen from contractors is, is columns should be spliced no less than every two levels, three levels if you can. You don't want to do it floor by floor. You don't build steel that way. It, it slows it down way too much. And column fixity at the base. Um, I haven't had a moment frame that doesn't want column fixity. Uh, because that first floor just drifts like crazy and it drives the rest of your design. You have to worry, you have to think about the fixity details though. But we have a great example in this seismic design manual that shows a way to do that. But then don't forget about the rest of the foundation, the footing, because once you get the load in the spread footing, it may not be able to take it, so you may need to add grade beams. So you have to look at the whole system. I suggest do it early to make sure that you're not adding a lot of cost to the foundation that you didn't anticipate. 
or get that cost into the project early so that the contractor knows about it. Okay, shifting on then to brace frames. Uh, we have protected zones as well, where we can't attach things to. Uh, try to keep the height to the length less than or equal to about five. Uh, when you do height, and that's to be economical. You can be uneconomical and go up to about 10. Once you're over 10, you're in a world of hurt. So 10 is about the limit uh, to make things work. And the high-rise world lives in the 10 to 1 aspect ratio, but they pay a lot of money for those. Uh, and this angle is very important. You keep it from 40 to 50 degrees. I showed you that BRB way at the early on at the beginning that we had like a 30 degree angle. Not good. This is more optimum to get it to work right. And the two-story X configuration, all things being equal, is, is the best way to go uh, for, for all the cost and, and detailing and, and building it. A two-story X is, 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 is the preferred configuration, uh, mainly because you only have three connections per bay. And you get the advantage of the fact that when things buckle, that this gets into compression and compression, you have a tension brace that takes the load from here to here. It's a very good system when things like that start to happen. Um, if it's an SCBF, you need to balance the braces, tension and compression. You have to keep them aligned. Uh, if it's a BRB, don't have to. One of the benefits. That's the benefits BRBs allow that to be very flexible. Um, Chevron configurations are what the architects love. Why? You get doorways, just as I show through here. But if we're talking about ordinary and special CBF, that beam gets huge. It's a W36 to get from the very beginning. Again, BRBs, I'll talk about it a little bit. That challenge goes away dramatically. But this beam gets big, so even though they love the configuration, let them know immediately this is a W36 beam. They're going to pay for it. Um, this is a, a single-story X. Sorry I drew it so big. Uh, we like to avoid these because why? There's five connections in a single bay. Five connections is, is a lot more cost than you need. Uh, it, you'd prefer, prefer to do something like this, uh, like I said in the previous slide. Oops. Uh, just to minimize the number of connections uh, when building that. And this K-brace configuration is not allowed. Just let, to remind you, it's amazing you can do it in R equal three world, but we can in high seismic. The difference between low and high. Controlling gusset plate sizes is one of the, one of the strong tips we'll leave you today. Uh, truth be told, this is Raphael Sibeli's work, uh, does great stuff on thoughts in making sure that gusset plates are rational. Avoid one size fits all scheduling. What we attempt to do is create a bunch of gusset plates and say, I'll take the maximum of this dimension and a maximum of that dimension, and all of a sudden you got one that's huge. I'll show you an example of that in just a minute. Avoid a 30 degree fan. I'll show you what that means here as well. Consider specifying a gusset plate width directly on the drawings. Sam, I want this to be this amount. Again, I'll show you an example. Think about a slightly modified work point. If something isn't completely concerning, it's not a, necessarily a big deal. And you can get more economy out of a detail by allowing it, it to be offset two to four, maybe six inches. And consider other smart details. Use your own ingenuity to make it, make it work. And this is something that we do, and, and obviously Raphael's firm does as well. We use a spreadsheet tool to do a gusset plate design, but it's graphical. So you can see when you design it what it looks like. Because if you don't see what it looks like and you see it for the first time in the field, sometimes you're surprised and sometimes you look silly uh, in what you designed. So here's a graphing calculator uh, approach, a tool that, that he uses. And you, here's one where you can specify the gut, gusset plate width. And then that's what you design and you make sure it all works given that approach, given that uh, design width. Specified width, and here's a modified work point. This is, this, uh, given this modified specified width, the work point doesn't necessarily work concentrically with the beam and the column. Oops. And that's not necessarily a bad thing, uh, because that ex small eccentricity can easily be taken up in the column and beam connection. So you get a very efficient plate, if you will, in doing it that way. Uh, sometimes vertical and horizontal legs required lengths yield required width. And here's a concentric work point, and what you start to see now is a gusset plate that's getting a little bit bigger, right? It's bigger than the one we saw before. Bigger means more material, and not necessarily better performance either. Here's one with a 30 degrees width, or the fan that is described here, the Whitmore section, if you will. There's something that we were taught, at least I was, a long time ago. But what you see here is what's happening. My gusset plate is getting bigger and bigger and bigger, and, and, and artificially saying, I need to have this 30 degree fan width. 
And again, if I force this to be concentric and all of a sudden this, this point goes out further than it needs to instead of being brought in like we did earlier in the other configuration. And you end up with gusset plates that look like this. And here's, here's what it looked like with a 30 degree fan. Here's your 2T dimension and here's your gusset plate. And you have to start adding things like stiffeners at the end of this gusset plate to make it work because you have this unbraced edge that's very long. So you're starting adding material and, and steel that, if you didn't do it this way, you'd, you were more precise about the width as to begin with, you'd, you get a better answer, less material, and, and at the end of the day, you'll get better performance with the other approach. And another thing is if you, if you are doing the scheduling approach, where you, and you have an alpha and a beta, and it's twice that shown here, using a 30 degree fan, concentric work point, and you use this envelope approach. If you have a case one, you have a design where two alpha is 16 inches and two beta is 26. That's one gusset, one condition. Do a case two with another gusset somewhere else because the geometry is a little bit different. And then you decide to make them the same. Take the worst of both of those dimensions. So you take two alpha is 27 from this case two. Take two beta was 26 in this case. And then you schedule it. And they build it. And you end up with something like that. There's a couple things wrong with that. One is it's very large, and two, that gusset was never designed, right? You took case one, which you designed, and you made it all work. You took case two and designed it, but taking the envelope of two, this design has never really been calculated specifically. And you look like that in the field, that's when you get embarrassed, and you look at the iron work, and he looks at you and goes, oh, really? That's the best you can do, engineer? And that's when I send the young engineer out, and he can take the heat for me. So that's what the young engineers are for. So again, very pointed stuff. And here's an example graph design. His largest gusset plate with a 30 degree fan concentric to a more precise, if you will, a more specific defined gusset plate width. And there's a difference. And that's a huge difference, guys. There's a lot of cost savings there. It's easier to build, faster to build. It's, it's, it's a win-win. You get smallest gusset plate. Now, that's SCBF kind of detailing, constructability kind of ideas. Some clear advantage of BRBFs. I, I mentioned a few already. Uh, here's some more specifics. We have balanced hysteresis, meaning in tension and compression, you get, well, essentially the same behavior. You actually get better in compression than tension, as I state here. We get a good energy dissipation. It's, it's full loops. It's not a pinched loop like SCBFs are. And pinched loops aren't bad necessarily at all, but they're pinched. Um, yet you have stability, meaning you can do this cycle after cycle after cycle. You can do these dozen scores hundreds of times, and it works just fine. They have very good strength, very good stiffness. I mentioned earlier they're very balanced strength and stiffness in a BRBF, and that they work very well that way. You're not oversizing something. You're sizing it spot on, more or less for strength and stiffness at the same time, which is the best economical way to go. And it's got to go large, large a long fracture life. It goes through lots of cycle, which is important, especially when you live in my neck of the woods, Seattle, Washington, where our big event is going to last me three minutes of strong shaking. And so I want long fracture life to make it through those sorts of events. Advantages that we talked about bef briefly before, the force distribution, I can do this and not to worry about because tension and compression are already balanced. It can handle it in both directions, where a, a, a concentrically braced frame can't do that. It can't design that way. There's no, no, there's no penalty for that. And for the uh, design of the beam, if you have a chevron configuration, this, this differential between tension and compression is fairly small. And this beam is not a W36 by whatever. It's a W24. It's, it's a modest increase in size of the beam to deal with the chevron configuration in a BRBF. So it's, it's not a big penalty. It's very helpful um, architecturally. Now a little bit on diaphragms. It's, it's, the, it's the stepchild of structural engineering practice because we don't, I think we've done better in late about providing some tech briefs by NIST. Have, who's seen the NIST technical briefs in, at all? Who's seen those? Really? I, they're free. Uh, that's, that's the most important, they're free. There's one that Raphael wrote on diaphragms uh, that deals with this sort of stuff that's worth getting. You can download them from, uh, from, like I said, from NIST. There's seven or eight now, I think, maybe, maybe more, but maybe 10. Diaphragms are included in this. And so if you want to learn more about diaphragm approaches for steel decks and composite, go read Raphael's. If you want to learn about concrete slabs and things like that, read mine. Uh, but there's more tech briefs on other systems.
get them for free. They're worth it. They're 30 pages long. Uh, uh, there's some really good material in there. And diaphragms are no longer the stepchild of engineering. There's some documents out there that, that can help us. Uh, there's analysis of them, though. Um, there's basically the code level forces. You're dealing with either FX, the forces that are basically in your lateral force reducing system, or the diaphragm forces, FPX. You have to think about two sets of forces in dealing with diaphragms. But really as important is the transfer effects and the backstay effect. I want to talk a, lot, a little bit more about those. Um, you have to think about the frame layout, especially at SCBF. I talked about that briefly because it's hard to know when a collector is part of the, B, the brace frame or not. Is the, and so like, and there's some issues relative to that. You can use the reinforcement in the slab as the collector. You can add some oops, uh, steel there. Or the steel framing member as a collector. And you have to make those decisions. What's the best way to go? I prefer to use a steel member as much as I can because it's there. And it doesn't necessarily need much upsizing, if any, to do dual duty of gravity and seismic collecting. Uh, composite studs, I'll talk about that in just a second. They're, they're there. The studs are there for composite action. You can use them for lateral at the same time. There's, a, there's some techniques for doing that. And there's ways to think about the collector connections and how to deal with the, the, the gravity shear and the, the collector shear to make or collector tension to make sure that you got the right design. Transfer forces. Um, most people think about transfer forces at, a, at the bottom of the building, at the foundation level, or a taller building at a podium level. But transfer forces occur at every level, right? Because even if, and this is showing here a dual frame kind of system, uh, where you have a frame and a wall, or this is a, sh a steel plate sure wall, of course. Uh, and these f kind of fight each other. And when you see these things fight each other, there's a transfer going on between these at every single level. But that is not only the place that happens. It happens in a SCBF where you change a brace size on this side and you don't on this side, and load then gets transferred through the diaphragm because it goes from this line of bracing to that line of bracing. So you need to think about that transfer because it's happening all the time and coming up with ways to account for that. It truly is accounting in my mind to make sure you have the load flow back and forth. It takes a lot of thinking and thought process. And again, the tech brief does a nice job of describing that. Uh, don't just use an amplification of FP over FX. That's the, the, the way I used to do it a long time ago until I was taught better. You need to really look and judge and look at that transfer uh, floor by floor to get the right demands going to and from. You need to include rho and omega zero when appropriate. Rho is included always with uh, FX, and omega zero is used with FP. And the code is very clear, I think, in ASC 7 10 regarding these terms and the use. The backstay effect. Who's designed a building over 10 stories here? This is a huge deal, uh, especially when it gets to 40 stories. What we have here is a, about a 12 or 14 story building, and it would affect this one as well. All of a sudden, you're building up your, your shear and your moment in the, in the superstructure, and all of a sudden, you hit a very stiff podium level, or in this case, a grade level. It doesn't have to be a grade, but typically it might be. And all of a sudden, you get the load that was here and a positive and goes all the way to a negative. So the diaphragm shear that needs to be transferred is not just this value, it's the sum of this plus that. So essentially you're designing for the shear of your building that says 100 kips, your backstay shear may be 200 kips. It's a backspan of a cantilever, right? That's what this is, and that load gets big. And the code really doesn't clue you into this very well at all, but if you do your analysis and you track the loads properly, they get really big, and if you don't think about this up front, what you'll do, the mistake, I used to make is that my diaphragm transfer slab was too small. You know, three and a half on three. It, it's not. It's got to be much thicker than that. It's got to be at least, you know, six on three or nine on three. If to do it right, especially if this building gets taller and taller. In the concrete world we live in, on occasion, sorry, we do concrete design as well, that slab is 15 inches thick as, as a minimum at this condition because you can't get the loads in and out. They're huge. So be very careful about this. It's a very real effect. And it doesn't have to be a 40-story building, guys. It can be a 10-story building that this, this happens on. Uh, and it's something that we don't think about, but these diaphragm tech briefs and this diagram here that Raphael presented do a great job of showing it and the, and the issue that is associated with that. A I said determine Murley. And this is important. Adjust the model. Adjust your stiffness properties. You don't have to, don't do a rigid diaphragm at a transfer diaphragm. Don't don't model it that way. Crack it because it's it's not going to be a rigid system, right? Make it, put that put the uh, diaphragm stiffness in the model. Very important to do that. And you have to check the overturning. Uh, and we do this on occasion, depending on how big it is. Uh, 
you can check the foundation for full overturning, assuming that that back stay isn't there, meaning that the system brings it all the way down. We do that on occasion. It depends on the building. Uh, if you want to get rid of this back stay approach, consider, and we've done this before as well, uh, seismic separation, meaning as it comes down to the grade level, separate the diaphragm there and bring the, the system down all the way to the foundation without any back stay effect. We've done that on a couple of buildings. The details are very tricky to cause it to slip and have the right amount of slip and, and things like that. So that's, that's one way to do that. And consider looking at um, force limiting interconnections. You can, like a BRB could be used for that. If that, it can't transfer any more than the BRB can deliver, that's one way to, to cleverly use a transfer system. And again, tune the force over multiple levels by, by the thicknesses and the stiffnesses of them. So it doesn't have to be done all at one level. And typically, if you model it, just in a normal way, it goes, over, it goes over two levels if you have a deep foundation or deep basement. It's a two-level transfer, typically. OK, uh, talking about collectors, if you go to the 2009 MSC, Modern Steel Construction, uh, issues about how to use and how to account for studs that we use for composite. You can also use them for these are composite studs. The shears are all go, going this way and that way. But in a collector, the shears are going one way, right? As you collect loads in one way, so you get to use half the studs again because it, you essentially unload them, right? Because these studs are going this way and this way, the shear. When you do a collector, the shears are all going in one direction, so you get to use and unload half the studs. So you get to use half the studs for free. So it's all laid out in more detail than I just gave it here. There's a technique there. So you're not adding a bunch of studs when you don't need to, right? Studs aren't very costly, but if you're adding 50 studs on every collector, that will add up over a big building fairly quickly. Uh, and here's an un, uh, the summary uh, out of the seismic design manual about unbraced lengths for collectors and how to think about how to brace them. Here's the table. Uh, if you're doing, you have a steel deck with ribs parallel. The bracing is for the uh, minor axis flexural buckling will always control over torsional. So think about the bracing for the minor axis flexural loading. So that's the one that will govern if your ribs are parallel. Again, this is we don't, when you only have a steel deck uh, supporting your diaphragm. You have a horizontal bracing diaphragm. It's kind of like a steel deck because you're only bracing it at discrete points. Same sort of situation. You need to brace. The governing thing will be the minor f axis flexural buckling length of your collector. So you have to brace it according to that requirement uh, out of AISC. Typically, on most levels, though, we have composite deck or we have a complete uh, concrete slab. Uh, what controls is, well, you don't, you don't have minor flexural buckling because it's braced the whole way. So it's not, it's not to worry. Uh, you have to think about the torsional brace points there. And then still deck again here, same sort of situation. Again, this is in the manual, uh, table 8-1. And dealing with collector connections, how to deal with the fact that you have gravity shears coming down, you have tensile loads coming out. Here's an approach to combine the two. Uh, demands to make sure that you have the right amount of capacity in your connection, the number of bolts or the welds. In this case, we're showing the bolt uh, condition here to combine the different demands to make sure that it's, it's a connection that's appropriate. OK, in my last section, how am I doing? Good. Not too good, actually. Uh, fabricator and erector's perspective. We had some guys on our team that said, here's some things I want every engineer to know. Mike, before I ask that question, how many here are fabricators and erectors? OK, good. The rest of us have a lot to learn, because you have a lot of good points. Uh, this is key. Uh, develop relationships with the fabricators and erectors for lots of reasons. Um, even though, even if you're doing a hard bid job where you can't really talk to them because they'll be bidding on it, get an idea of what the means and methods are where you might be doing the design helps. I was doing a major healthcare project in Anchorage. You know what they don't do in Anchorage? They don't weld. Everything's bolted. Everything's bolted. It's cold, right? Otherwise, you never build. So we were told early on, Hooper, you're going, to weld, you're going to bolt everything. Every moment frame was bolted. So you need to know that. And you won't know that until you talk to this fabricator director that's likely to get the job or is actually on your job. Market conditions. You know, how, what's the price of steel? Is there a certain material grade that's more uh, price sensitive or not? Um, is welders, you know, what's happening with the welding? Where's the steel coming from? All those sorts of things. Skilled labor. In some places, uh, they don't have as good a welding skilled labor. So bolting is going to be preferred. They will know that in the jurisdiction or location that this thing will be built. 
So that becomes a very important thing that you can hear, you can learn from them. And what they stressed to me a lot was provide the actor, if, if you're doing system selection, you're saying, I have a BRB approach, I have a moment frame, give them accurate information about the, the tonnage of what you're talking about so they could do the system comparison. It's not just about the tonnage. They have to think about schedule, erection sequence, and all these things, but they need the accurate tonnage to start their process. And equally important is what's included in your tonnage. Are you including the connections? Yes or no. To, and those sorts of things. Are you including the anchor rod connections to the foundation so they can price this effectively if they're on your team providing guidance uh, early on in the project? Uh, this is key. Uh, and we have really good buckling restraint braced frame manufacturers now. We didn't have that necessarily 15 years ago. They're all out in the exhibition hall. They'll love to talk to you. But if you know who you're dealing with early, uh, first of all, I suggest you get them selected early even on a hard bid job. You can do that if you're careful so that you can start to work with them about the right connections that you can use or you want to use, especially if they're going to be architecturally exposed. Architects care about that sort of thing. But get to work with them about what their system is best done with. Again, uh, we try to bid this out at design development to get them involved from then on out to make sure that we supply the right, who does a connection handoff kind of stuff. Very important. Reference requirements from the building code and, and the standards. Uh, don't rewrite them. They don't want it. They know that they know these codes and standards. They don't want to hear it reworded. Just refer to them. Avoid special requirements. Don't add to it unless you absolutely need to, because the specs are written by a lot of smart people over decades and decades. Use them. They want you to use them. Uh, and again, don't have redundant, don't have redundancy in the specs and the general notes, because invariably, our firm included, the general notes and specifications don't always say the exact same thing for the exact same issue. So don't put them in two places. Just like you don't dimension something twice, don't do standards and specs twice. Uh, it just causes confusion because they'll never be the same. Um, don't just reference the latest edition of the coder standard in your, in, your, in, your, in your general notes. Be very specific. Give them the exact date uh, because that's important because they will use that document accordingly. And this is interesting. I, uh, these are the kind of guys that like to be out there a little bit. Even though the spec isn't done, they want you to specify it. Got to be a little bit careful there because one, you're out on a limb a little bit because that spec may not be perfect yet, but the building official may not allow you to do it either. And they mentioned that to me. They said, well, John, we like to do that because there's advantages. There's new stuff coming out we're going to take advantage of. So on that bullet, I'd be careful as a structural engineer of record, but on occasion we do this because new stuff is coming down the pipeline that is going to help the project. So we'll try to take advantage of that. And another strong point, they said, don't redo the figures. Don't redraw the copole detail. Don't do that. Just use it and, and uh, use what's in the spec. Because they're used to it, that's what they want to see. And if, we, if it's required to do so, match the standard exa exa exactly, not or, but and if there's any different state, what's different? So they can see what's different, right? You can have the detail drawn exactly, and you're making one little thing different, and they'll never see it, <laughs> right? Let them know what is different, because that'll affect the pricing, right? It'll affect the cost of fabrication, et cetera. They want to know what's going on. Uh, things that matter matter more in high seismic. Uh, what does that mean by that? Emissions in the drawings, uh, because or the fabrication error or tolerance issues. Why? Because the level of inspection, the jurisdictional requirements for doing an RFI. Some jurisdictions now require the structural engineer of record sign wet sign every RFI, every single RFI, which slows down the process immensely. Imagine getting the, the guy that stamped the drawings to sign every RFI. Um, anyways, it, it's a big deal. It's amplified in high seismic because the fixes aren't as simple. If you, if you can do an Article 3 system, fixes are a little bit more. You can do the toolkit of fixed approaches is broader. You have something wrong with a BRB, I'm not sure how you fix that other than getting a new BRB type of thing. So the fixes are much more challenging in high seismic. There's the, the range of opportunity is smaller. Uh, they want us out in the field to harass us about how bad we designed it, possibly. They want us out in the field, though, to f sense the problems before they arise so that we can f get on the same page. So they really like us on the field working with them hand in glove. They really stress prefab and pre-erection meetings. They see extreme value in that. I know our firm does. And it's nice to know that they feel the same way, so that you're all on the same page. You have a schedule in mind. You know what's going to be happening. And provide the schedule for when we're going to be out there in the field as well. 
make sure the, the WPS is un understood and identified so that everyone's on the same page relative to it as well. It's a big deal. We've gotten much better at this since the Northridge earthquake. I think we've gotten fairly mature in, in dealing with WPSs. Uh, use discretion when de uh, assigning, especially de demand critical designations on your drawings. Do it where it's required. What, we're, what they have been seeing is that engineers don't know, or they said more is better. So they, they said more demand critical in every well ever. And that's not what we should be doing. You, we're spending money where it's not needed, slowing down the schedule, et cetera. The spec is very clear on what demand critical is. Just put it there. Or if there's something else that's special for you, that's fine. But they're very, they, they see it happening way too often. And people are getting, they called us lazy. Because if we just say everything's demand critical, we don't want to think about it. They suggest don't do that. And with that, I will thank you for my portion of the talk. Uh, do you want to do questions on this portion now, or do you want to go to Scott? What's your, what's your pleasure? Let's go to Scott. Let's go to Scott first, yeah. Thanks, John. Let's give John a hand. Okay, our next speaker is Scott Aiden, PhD SE. Scott is the Director of Seismic Assessment Services at A IVI International. He is the Principal at Aiden Engineering. Chief Structural Engineer at Steel Cast Connections. For the Structural Engineers Association of Northern California, Scott chairs their steel subcommittee and is a member of the AISC Seismic Manual Committee. And uh, his work is found in the latest edition of the manual. Please welcome Scott Aiden. Thank you and good morning. It's, uh, thank you for everyone for coming out uh, so early this morning. You have to keep in mind, West Coast guys like us, you know, to us, it's 5 a.m. <laughs> We're up here. <laughs> I did too. I, my hotel was a little further out, and so I had to make sure that I could get in here on time. Uh, so I was up at my time like around 3 a.m. Anyway. Listen, I'd like to, first of all, uh, thank uh, Brent for the opportunity to be here with you today. And also um, uh, thank John for his words that uh, he gave. We're going to build a little bit on what he said, uh, particularly zero in on um, moment frame. A lot of what John shared with you is a lot of hard-hitting facts and figures and, and, and uh, items. Now we're going to kind of zero in on a little more of the theoretical and thought-provoking material, as particularly when it comes to moment frames. And I'd like to just um, uh, thank uh, Brent for the opportunity to be here again and share the podium with someone like John. I've been uh, had the pleasure of knowing John for a number of years since I, uh, beginning back when I was practicing structural engineering in Seattle. I'm now down in the Los Angeles area, uh, but uh, it's always a pleasure to see John and work with him and share the podium with him today. One of the things that John mentioned was uh, he referred to these uh, NIST seismic uh, design guides. I just wanted to give a plug for mine, the one I did on steel moment frames. And uh, that is also available uh, for a free download. I also want to point out another thing John mentioned. In the new seismic provisions manual, there is now uh, some examples of steel moment frame bases, which I developed and, in, and included in the manual. One is kind of for the st typical standard moment base where you have a, a base plate. Uh, but sometimes the design limit states for those type of base plates, when you get to be really large columns with a very large overturning, very large shear forces, get a little bit difficult to stay within the parameters. And so we also included in there an embedded 
column design. Now, the embedded column design is simply based on a lot of the provisions that were developed for coupling beams. Because if you think about it, if you think about you've got a, a steel wide flange coupling beam going into a concrete wall, if you rotate that 90 degrees, you've got your uh, embedded column base. All righty. I'd like to, some of the research that I'm going to be presenting here today, I'd like to just give some acknowledgments. Some funding was provided by the uh, Structural Engineers Association of Northern California as part of the 2010 Special Projects Initiative. I'd also like to uh, thank uh, Helmut Krawlinkler, who was a co-author with me on this particular manual here. We'll be drawing some of the, uh, some of the information out of that manual. Um, I'd also like to thank uh, Professor Larry Reevleaf up at the University of Utah. Uh, Larry was my dissertation chairman a number of years ago, and we collaborated on some of the research that I'm going to tie in on moment frames here as well. Okay, John kind of went through some of the advantages with special moment frames, but I just want to refresh a little bit of what he said. Uh, you know, like he was mentioning, it has the highest uh, response modification factor, R equal 8. It uh, facilitates the architectural versatility, like he was saying, you know, the health. Uh, nobody wants to have braces in terms of their programming. Uh, and it's one of the only systems that can go over 160 feet in terms of uh, ASCE 7. Of course, as he mentioned, the disadvantage is weight. And that's where this research wants to focus in on. You know, the weight behind these uh, moment frames, particularly when you have W14 columns, can get rather uh, cost uh, prohibitive. Now, first of all, we also want to talk a little bit about the design. You know, uh, moment frames are designed to, to uh, withstand lateral forces through flexure and shear in, in the connections and in the, in the members. A little bit un, un, unlike a braced frame or EBF or uh, where you're taking that, the, the, that force through, the, through tension and compression in the braces. Um, so your beams uh, and column selections are dependent on, in some cases, strength. But in most cases, as John pointed out in his presentation, you're going to be uh, on lateral deflection and drift. That's going to be your driver here. And as John mentioned, you know, you, you calculate your period, but ASCE 7 allows you to go to that higher period when you're looking at your drift analysis. And that's, that's something I want to emphasize here. It, 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 you know, you do have kind of this lower limit that uh, ASCE 7 gives you for uh, when determining your, str your strength provisions. But the strength you're going to find on a lot of multi-story moment frames in high seismic regions isn't going to be what's driving you. you you're going to, your, your drift is going to be what's driving you, particularly on these uh, health facilities, like John mentioned, where you have uh, the 1% uh, the uh, maximum drift ratio. So uh, the lateral deflection and drift are going to be driving the boat. So the stiffness that you can drive out of, out of your moment frame is going to be critical. Okay, So that's why. Uh, you want to make a, a lot of people nowadays, uh, and you know this is a lot of relatively recent. A lot of people are are, are going away from using W14 columns in moment frame designs, and they're going to these deeper sections. Now, there's a lot of things. You know, obviously it's intuitive for us to say, well, if we use a deeper section. That's going to be savings because obviously the deeper sections we can get the same amount of stiffness at a lower price. But up until now, um, at a lower weight, excuse me. Up until now, no one has really done any research to say, okay, yeah, let's go to a deeper column, but how much can that save us? How much, what are, what are the numbers? Has anybody run the numbers to see when you go to uh, a deeper column, what, what kind of savings or weight uh, reductions are you going to be seeing? And that's kind of where, where this kind of research wants to go. Let's see when we go to a deeper column, let's see where the savings are, uh, how much weight can we save, OK? Um, so we're going to see some indirect, we're going to see frame weight comparisons. We're going to see some indirect, also economic benefits. Because if you obviously, if you have a lighter column, 
that's going to facilitate your column splices. That's going to facilitate your beam to columns connections uh, because all of a sudden you're in a situation where you're not having to weld quite as much. Uh, but, but there's a caveat here. We have to look at, when we're using deep columns, some of the inelastic cyclic behavior considerations. And when I'm referring to that, I'm, I, I, we're going to be talking a little bit about potential instabilities because these deeper columns tend to have less uh, uh, localized stiffness to, for uh, local rotation of the flange, particularly when you're using something like the reduced beam section, which tends to uh, have a lot of inherent lateral torsional buckling when you're going into that inelastic uh, behavior. Okay, so just to step back a minute now, here, here's kind of some of the thought-provoking stuff that I wanted to share with you this morning. Um, we're going to go back to my, uh, our uh, design guide. And um, in this design guide, there's a methodology here that just goes in using the portal method that uh, Helmut, Dr. Carl Winkler, developed um, to kind of look at what is the contribution of drift per each of the elements, the beam flexure, column flexure, and panel zone deformation. Those are kind of the three components that are going to be resisting our lateral, that are going to be providing our lateral stiffness and, re and resisting drift. So let's look at those three components and then do some um, per, uh, parametric studies on different column depths to kind of make some comparisons and see what, you know, what that, how that pans out, what are the uh, what are the benefits of using each one? Now, Dr. Carl Linkler's uh, formulation kind of breaks down the three different components here, and you can go and download this manual and, and see a little bit more descriptive uh, terminology of, on what those components are, but I've kind of outlined them here. Don't worry about the formulas right now. That's something y y you hear a lot. You just should never focus on, on uh, formulas and presentations people's eyes start to gloss over. We're not going to really focus on the formulations too much. You can go back and do your homework and, on that. But I do want to mention, when we did this study, when we're going to make these comparisons, we are going to only select column and beam member sizes that you know fit all the criteria that AISC 360 and AISC 341 and 358 provide. So we're, you know, because there's so many potential beam and column pairings that we could kind of look at. It's, it's, it's almost an infinite number uh, of combinations. So we want to, first of all, narrow, whittle that down to just a, 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 you know, a couple dozen uh, maximum. Uh, so we want to throw everything that's not highly ductile out the window. And when I say highly ductile, that's the old, new terminology. Uh, the old terminology with the thickness ratios, many people are fam more familiar with that. We're only going to pick beam to column elements that are in a strong column weak beam, or in other words, that your uh, beam column ratio has to be greater than one. We're going to include, uh, make sure that we include uh, continuity plates and doubler plates. And we're just going to kind of focus in, for this, for this particular reason, we're just going to focus in on one connection. There are uh, several dozen connections in 358. Uh, for example, as John mentioned, some people like bolted connections. Uh, I was the author of chapter 9, FYI, uh, just a little plug for myself and the connection that I was able to work with in 358, the Kaiser bolted bracket. I was the author of that provision. It's an all bolted connection. Uh, I think it's a great, great solution for places like Alaska and for others kind of, it's a very niche type of connection. Uh, uh, it's not the always, always the best one for the best situation, but it, it, it can find its use. Anyway, in this particular study, we're going to be looking at the Woof W, welded on reinforced flange, welded web. Okay, so what are the Woof W limitations? Well, you can't have a beam flange thickness that's greater than one inch. So we can throw away a lot of the beams that anything is greater than than one inch. Uh, your overstrength factor has to be 1.4, and your plastic hinge. Uh, just to facilitate things, because on a lot of the RBS and uh, bolted flange plate, bolted bracket, 
the, uh, the plastic hinge is some distance away from the column and you have to kind of add that into your calculations to facilitate things. We're going to select the woof W because its plastic hinge happens to be at the face of the column so that makes it a little bit simpler to make those, those uh, calculations and comparisons. Okay, so we made all of our comparisons here. We came up with a bunch of tables. Don't look at this too much because your eyes are going to gloss over. It's too early. I don't want you fall, falling asleep quite yet. So I'm going to zero in on these tables and we're going to kind of just focus really quickly and I'm going to tell you what these tables are doing. Okay, on the first two columns you can see kind of the pairings that I've got up here. Uh, first of all, we're starting out with, a, with a, uh, our, our kind of baseline, a W14. That's going to be kind of, you know, because what we want to do is we want to find out, we want to compare W14 versus the deeper sections, right? Okay, so we pick a beam that goes with that W14 column that's going to give us a beam to column ratio of as close to but greater than one as we possibly can. So you can see here the pairing that we've got here according to uh, ASE, AISC 341, our beam to column ratio following the provisions in there gives us a, a pairing here of 1.06. Then we go ahead and select the deeper column sizes, staying with a beam then that keeps us about that same ratio. So we're having an apples to apples comparison here. You know, we want to we want to stay with the uh, beam to column ratio that's still one, and at the same time, okay. So uh, we'll talk about some of these other columns lately. We're just fo focusing in on these first two columns here, where I've got red circled. Our baseline W uh, is a woof W baseline column. We're going to be looking at uh, a lot of different beam sizes, w8, uh, W18, 21, 24, 27, tw uh, W30, W33. And we're also going to be looking at a lot of comparison columns, 18, 21, 24, 27, 20, 30, 33. So you can see there's a lot of different combinations we can have. But we also want to make sure that we're genetic, uh, geometrically compatible. And what I mean by that is that our beam flange width doesn't exceed the column flange width because obviously if you're moment frame, you have to be less than or equal, uh, otherwise you're not going to be able to develop the full flange. Okay, uh, now we're going over here. As I mentioned uh, in the previous slide, I should have waited till this slide. Our moment ratio to make sure that we're apples to apples, we're starting out uh, as close to equal to one as possible. And then on our normalized drift, our you can see uh, on our, for, we get our first combination uh, with a beam column ratio of one, we measure the drift, we normalize it to one, and then on our, on our subsequent combinations, we try and get the drift as close to or less than one as possible. That way, again, we're staying apples to apples, okay? Because if we were to all of a sudden mess around with our drift ratios or our moment ratios, then we're not, you know, we don't have a, a fair comparison, okay? Uh, so anything that on our moment ratio, anything greater than 1.5, we throw out, subassembly not included. On our drift ratio, we're making sure that we're less than uh, 1, but greater than uh, 0.9. Uh, that way, kind of, we're staying in the comparison kind of parameters. Uh, if we're greater than 3, comparison beams group not included. Okay, so now we're looking at, uh, in, in, as we go through the table here, we're kind of looking at the story drift. We're getting our normalized components and we're breaking them up. Uh, uh, we looked at the Kraulwinkler formulation a little bit earlier in a little bit earlier slides. Now we have the three components of how they're breaking out uh, based on the beam, uh, based on the column, based on the panel zone deformation, including the use of doubler plates. Okay, so. We go through, I showed you all that, those big tables. There's actually a couple pages of those uh, where we get all these formulations. And uh, that research hopefully is going to get published soon so you can look a little bit closer at that. But anyway, here's kind of the, the drift formulation for b the beam flexure. We can kind of see, you know, at the W14 we're starting out and then we kind of level out as we go on. We can also look then at the column. You can definitely see uh, an improvement here, you know, reduced as we as we go to the large, larger column sizes, there's definitely a decrease here. We're going from 16.6 .6 down to 8.9. That's over uh, a 43% reduction. Um, and then, so now we've got to the end of our table, we can kind of look at 
what is our subassembly weight comparisons? We start out zero for, the, for our baseline W14, and then we can kind of look at the, then the comparison sizes. All right, so let's look at that in a way that can uh, be maybe a little bit more visual instead of looking at a table. Uh, a, a graphical representation is always a little bit easier. You can see all the different combinations that we have here uh, starting out on our, on our vertical axis here with our baseline, our, our W14 sections here. And then as our frame weight, uh, as our column depth increases on the vertical axis, you can see that we're increasing 10%, 20%, 30%, up to uh, you know uh, close to 40 percent when we're getting into our uh, uh, deep very deep column sizes okay so you know if we look at it if we look at the reductions here you know uh, uh, with the w18 we're we're 11.8 percent reduction all the way up to when we're going to a w33 column we're going all the way up to 34 percent reduction so that's significant. And now we can go out and tell our fabricator friends, hey, when you go to these deep column sections, you can save up to 34% on your weight. Question. Is a doubler always required to come up W? And does the deeper section make it more or less likely? I'll talk about that in a minute. OK, I'm going to get there. I will get there. Uh, OK, so uh, let's see. Uh, drift components, uh, I think I already went over this. Oh, what we can do now is what I wanted, uh, and I'm going to get back to the doubler plate, continuity plate provisions, because a lot of fabricators, erectors, want what this concept that's called a clean column. Clean column, uh, for those of you who aren't familiar with that terminology, that means no doubler plates, no continuity plates. Because as John pointed out, there's a very high cost associated with them. And a lot of times, a fabricator would prefer if you bumped up your column sizes a little bit. Now, what I mentioned here in it, uh, was the, the comparison study that we did here was uh, starting out with all beam column ratios equal to one, right? OK? Uh, so in that sense, when you go to these deeper columns, you're almost always going to be in a situation where you're going to need to have a doubler plate, OK? Now, uh, so this is this is only a comparison study to find out how much weight we save overall, quote unquote. Uh, so, uh, and we're we're considering whether or not we're going to expand that. Maybe go to make the same kind of comparisons if we have a beam column ratio of two, uh, and see if the if, if there's a possibility there you can eliminate doubler plates and continuity plates. But we'll talk about that in a minute because there's still a concern when you go to the deeper column, and I'm going to get to that. Okay. All right, but one of the advantages that we have now this database of kind of beam column uh, moment frame combinations that we've come up with, right? So now what we can do is we can reverse engineer and work backwards taking our, remember we came up with the Krawlinkler, uh, I introduced the uh, Krawlinkler formulation and the component for the column, we can now, since we have our database and we know what our combinations are, we can now work backwards and rearrange this equation, starting out with the equation up on top, rearrange it and find out what particular moment of inertia I would need for my column and then do a preliminary frame size. Okay, so that helps us, you know, a minute ago I was focusing on the, on the fabricators, uh, you know, he, touting how much weight we're going to save by using the deeper columns, but now I'm, I'm trying to help the engineers in the sense that we can now work backwards and figure out, you know, work up and figure out what preliminary column sizes we should use. Because once we know uh, that if, if we select, you know, use this equation working backwards from our database, we can figure out what initial preliminary column size we need. And then we know that if we go with the beam ratio as close to one as possible, we know that the, the beam and the, uh, the doubler plate and everything is gonna follow along with us. So we don't have to do all three calculations, we just need to do the one to figure out a preliminary frame size. Okay, so that, that's gonna help us. You, you may see that equation again in the next edition of the steel manual because we're going to try and get that in there uh, in the seismic uh, examples. All right, so just to kind of 
back up a minute, go back to our comparisons that we were making. There's some direct economic considerations here, again, for our fabricator friends. Reduce frame weight, 12 to 34 percent reductions, uh, going from a W18 up to a W33. What are the indirect cost savings? Well, uh, as I mentioned at the beginning, we're going to save a little bit of money on our column splice welds because now all of a sudden our, our column flanges are going to be a little bit thinner. It's not going to take our guys out there uh, welding those up uh, as quite as many passes. So there's going to be some savings there. There also may be a little bit of associated savings when, uh, 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 with the inspection when they come through and do the uh, their um, inspectors come back and do their special inspections. Okay, now I want to go back and, and look at the research that, uh, some of the research that I that associated with my uh, uh, PhD research work. Uh, this was, we were looking at uh, both a W14 and then a deeper column uh, without continuity plates to kind of see what are the, uh, you know, performance differences, okay? So, uh, we had four specimens. W14, two W14 by 283 columns, uh, and then two W18 by 211 columns. Beam sizes were all the same, W30 by 132 for all of them. So essentially, we're kind of keeping in that, where I was saying we're kind of staying as close to that ratio, beam column ratio of one with these, with these uh, pairings. Uh, but what we noticed, and this was with the reduced beam section, I want to qualify that, what we noticed was in the ones that, and we confirmed this with the finite element research this, that when, uh, was associated with this, uh, what we, what we um, let me just check how I'm doing on time. I'm okay, aren't I, Brad? I'm about to wrap up. Okay, all right. Uh, what we noticed here on when we go to the deeper sections, we start to see a little bit of instability, particularly when it's associated with the reduced beam section, because we get, we're getting this phenomenon that's, that we kind of termed as a local column instability or local column rotation, where the, the, the RBS starts to kick out lateral torsional buckling, and that kind of puts a local twist, you can see there, on that bottom flange connection. You don't see it at the top because we've got our deck there to, to kind of keep everything braced, but down at the bottom we're unbraced, and so there's a little bit of instability there. Now, if we look at the comparisons, you can see the comparisons I have. That W14 on the, on the left-hand side, you can see its deformed shape, it stays rigid and stiff. But you can definitely see that on the right-hand side, that the, the influence that that uh, 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 lateral torsional buckling is having on uh, both the, uh, the flange, it's twisting it, and also the web, it's getting a little uh, contorted as well. Okay, so those are the issues. Now, so the interim recommendation is everybody wants to have a, a clean column. But my research is recommending, hey, maybe guys, we need to look at this a little bit more, a little bit more closely. And I think AISC is now uh, spending some res a little bit of more research funding to look at some of these issues uh, and build off of some of this uh, uh, work that I've done. Okay, all right, so in conclusion, uh, we can say, you know, hey, now, we can now say that when we go with the moment frame, we, if, if we go with the deep column, we know what our potential savings can be, 12 to 34 percent. Um, we've got some further economic benefits associated with the welding, with the inspection, and uh, we know that uh, when we do, you know, uh, in terms of this instability, I, I, I forgot to mention this, but in terms of this instability, if we do have the continuity plates, my research showed if we do go back and put the the continuity plates in, that does seem to address this local flange instability issue, quote unquote. And so uh, the interim recommendation is to go ahead and, uh, uh, unless you have, uh, unless you can show that that instability is not going to occur uh, by some other, by providing some kind of uh, st uh, stability um, restraint, uh, that the uh, that the continuity plates do address the deep column instability concerns. 
All right, at this time, I'd like to uh, just go back over the, the PDH code for, for you uh, so you can uh, record that in your um, uh, log there for your credits and then open up the floor for questions, both for myself and for John. Well, uh, yes, thank you, thank you, Brent. The question was, uh, can we go in a situation where we just would put continuity plates on the bottom flange since we have the deck up there uh, to stabilize us? Uh, that's something, you know, that's kind of something that you would need to use a little bit of engineering judgment. There's no provisions for that. Uh, and probably more research would be needed before I could give you a definitive answer. I apologize that I can't definitively say yes or no, but I think we need to kind of consider, uh, uh, make a lot of considerations. In some situations, you're going to have a situation where the deck doesn't provide enough stability if you're kind of like in a corner connection or something like that. Uh, so there's a lot of uh, quantifiers I would put before I could give you an answer to that, uh, and most of them being that we need more research to look into uh, recommendations. Sorry. Well, right here? Yes. Yeah, my, my question is for John about okay. a, a special concentric brace frame. Yeah. Um, I'm coming from the fabricator side. I do a lot of connections with fabricators, and the problem that we're seeing out there for instance, in the Chevron brace, the engineers of record are designing the braces for the buckling. I'm not talking about anything special here. I'm not talking about uh, restraining. We're talking about yes. special. Mm -hmm. uh, they're designing for the uh, for the buckling strength, but they're they're sizing the members. Uh, they're sizing the uh, the connections are based on the full tensile capacity of the brakes. It's making for very uneconomical uh, problems for the uh, for the fabricator. I just wondered if you had a comment about that and if you're running into the same problem we are. Yeah. We see it a lot. Yeah. Uh, the, the question is the economy of an SCBF at a Chevron condition relative to the need to size for the tensile capacity, even though buckling controls. That, in my mind, or, or, or suggests the challenge with doing SCBF in a Chevron configuration, we're required to design that gusset connection for ASFY. Right? We need to make sure that that brace has that capacity. And then you also have to upsize the beam. That is why, and quite honestly, we go to BRBFs if we're going to do something like that. Those issues go away. Uh, you know, so we, we're able to just size the beam accurately. The connection goes smaller, and, and the, you have a balance in tension and compression. We see the same thing, and this, it's really hard to get economy in something that is challenged in that condition. We've got some pretty bullheaded engineers of record out there. Um, this, the cycling provisions allow you to design the connection for the actual loads or the forces that are delivered to the system. And uh, they're kind of bullheaded. Well, well, yeah. Well, let's let's take that one offline uh, because that provision is meant to do something totally different. The full capacity of the system is not meant, so. There's a different issue. Let's talk about that offline. Uh, the question is, well, if we do a small work point offset in a connection, do you model that directly? And, and typically, if it's small, I'm not going to do that because I don't know that up front. If it's two to three inches, it doesn't matter. If it gets to be six inches or more, then I start to put it in the model. It usually doesn't matter at the end, though, because your gusset plate is so large. The whole system is a big, rigid joint. But I don't want a building official come back later saying, did you model that? If you do two or three inches or less, I don't, it's not going to make any difference in the results, in my opinion. Yes. Uh, first of all, so John, you are just very interested in letting it out. Uh, I have a question about the gasset plate for the, this is the, this is the, for the gasset plate, you can for non-stack or for the PRP, they will be different. Yes. Because for the PRP, you have more capacity, only for 
percent of the customers. But for large span, the gas plate and the trust yard, we have also other more if the gas plate is on the main block, long plan, so it has a very high requirement for the for the load capacity. I'm sure I caught that question. <laughs> this, 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 yeah, we'll, we'll talk offline too. Yeah, 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 we'll talk offline on that one. Yeah, one question about Scott. Okay, go ahead. Uh, uh, in terms of the deep beam for this concept, uh, I'm, I'm trying to learn how to understand if this the deep beam which is increasing the local, increases the portion uh, stiffness. <coughs> if you from the 14 W14 to the 14 to the 43, is basically the increase in the portion stiffness for the and also, the, uh, maybe you can just put the carry in the later. So in this case, also, draft is your one of the criteria for your optimization, for, for, for your optimized design. In this case, I saw some people, they put some the local attachment to increase the stick, total stick and joint. They try to use another way to, to improve the time to use the a lot of material there. Let me see if I can re regurgitate your question. Um, what uh, this gentleman was saying was that there's some uh, perhaps concerns that there might be uh, some torsional concerns when you go to the deeper column section. And the answer to that, I think, is found in 341 that says, you know, you do have to have some bracing yep. coming in. Uh, uh, I think there is some some requirements and some penalties associated with it if you don't have bracing coming in uh, uh, orthogonally to brace your 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 connection, um, and then of course, like I was mentioning, uh, you know, there's some lateral torsional buckling associated sometimes with the with depending on what type of connection you're using, and that can, as I pointed out, can induce some potentially induce instability if you don't have a continuity plate. Of course, that needs a little bit more research to look at that and, ver and, and confirm and come up with some, some, some recommendations. Did that address your question? Yeah, it, it, it's, uh, it sounds, you know, we could probably discuss this a little bit uh, uh, clearer uh, offline, and, and I would invite anyone that's, we're uh, running a little bit short on time, uh, and so maybe we can uh, take that offline, and uh, is there time for one more question, or do we have to, one more question? Or if there's no more questions, we'd, uh, on behalf of John and myself, like to thank everyone for coming out. We were a pleasure to be here with you this morning.